Sibilance. Sibilance. <laughs> Hello, Cleveland! Hello, Cleveland! <laughs> I think a, a Spinal Tap reference is, uh, I, I, you know, every couple days I make that reference. <laughs> it's hard not to. <laughs> yeah. So much to draw from. Mm. Right. Okay. Well, we are we are live with another episode. So uh, thanks everyone for joining. What is is this? This is our sixteenth. Sixteenth. Yeah. Wow, 16th week in a row of doing this. This is the Microsoft Community Office Hours. And 16. Hey, yeah, that's right. I, I should have dressed up, done my hair. Yeah, <laughs> I should wreck Wore, a car. Worn a corsage. That's right. <laughs> Did you, what's it? What's his name? The, the, the guy that was in Breaking Bad and Malcolm in the Middle, the actor, the, the main guy. Um, oh, um, Brian Cranston. Yeah, Brian Cranston. Did you ever see his uh, sweet 60th? Like I think it was MTV or VH1 yeah. or something did like a spoof of mm-hmm. my sweet 60th, and he's still living with his parents, and he's he's <laughs> going the extreme. It's it's pretty fantastic. You need to check that out. I'm sure it is. That sounds yeah. cool. Surprise, so, MTV Mr. still Riz. Is. Mr. Riz. Hello, all. How's everyone? Hello. We are Riz. Dandy. Dandy. Mm. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, he's good. I'm gonna be on the beach today. I think. Ausgezeichnet. Um, all right. Well, let's uh, let's jump right in. Any any questions come up over the last week that you guys would like to start discussing? What's the deal with all the changes with OneDrive? Yeah, what is going on with OneDrive? I saw some. There's some sync questions posted today out on I'm the communities. Busy. Well, that and uh, the whole family sharing thing now, and they're actually, they still don't allow external, which all has something to do with your SharePoint backend, gobbly gook permissions. Be the uh, first time SharePoint mucked things up. Yeah. What? <laughs> it's got, let's say it's got a big legacy booty. <laughs> wow. That's baby that's got back. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You <laughs> reflect oh, into God. that bad boy, and man, you find all sorts of stuff. Yeah, I didn't read through. So, what's been going on with uh, with OneDrive? They added the ability to upgrade uh, larger files. I think they go up to um, a full what gig now or something like that, uh, and you know, individual files. Yeah, they raised the limit. They raised the limit. Um, they did a family sharing uh, edition now. So uh, what I understand is that, you know, you can share uh, the files, but it has to be, it's just like, it's just like SharePoint, right? You have to share it to people who are in your Active Directory. Um, so you're actually not doing anything different, um, but they opened it up to, uh, uh, what are they calling it now? Microsoft 365 home users mm. um, to allow to do that. Um, so there was just, you know, they had a big blurb announcement on their blog, a um, couple other changes. I thought you guys would know because you guys are the office experts, right? So I'm I've, seen, you. I've seen the rumblings. I mean, Hans Brender has been busy posting a bunch of stuff recently. I know he's been very active and he's Mr. OneDrive. So, yeah. Yeah. If you go to the Office 365 community <clears throat> page in Facebook and Hans has the top post there on that, uh, it, just talking about poking around the sync admin report. I've just, I, I've seen a couple of them. I've not read into any of them other than the announcement last week about the file size increase. And I uh, just wasn't sure if there was, was something else that happened. No, no. You just mentioned Facebook. So I, I just knocked you down another notch. It's, uh... <laughs> He, he well, needs that every now and then. Well, well, Mike, we, we are kind of doing these sessions and live streaming to the Facebook communities. So, oh, you know, you know, it's funny, though, every once in a while you get you know, people that come in and say, like, well, why are you out you know, in these in these spaces? Why aren't you live streaming to some other lo- odd location? It's like, well, because this is where people go and ask questions. So we're we go to the peeps. We go to the people. Take it to the people. But people shouldn't be using Facebook. It's bad. Eric, you got to unmute Eric if you want to talk. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's nice for us, three of us, but 
I don't have to unmute. My my teams just doesn't like my headset. This this headset, I can hear perfectly. I just can't speak. No problem. I don't like your headset. <laughs> yeah. Tell your, like you. tell your headset. We also don't like it. Here you you From tell us. us. You yeah. tell it. We tell it. You're like bad. It. You Yell are at it. bad. Bad headset. Bad headset. <laughs> It needs and donut aversion therapy. I say that just as I said it like that, and see my dog's ears kind of like, no, <laughs> not you. Oh, no, not you, not you. Uh, I, just before we started recording, before you guys jumped on, I was telling Sean, I don't have more information on this, but I'm excited. I'll, I will be able to talk to it this evening. Uh, but on the radio, my, my favorite radio show, Armstrong and Getty, they were talking about Donut aversion therapy. Really? It's, it's a uh, yeah. It's it's a legit thing. It sounds like I can, a I can get behind that. I can yeah. get behind that. Yeah, I can't. I'm I gotta, sorry. I just, yeah, I it's kind of. I I think it makes me think of a Homer Simpson about uh, using fireworks to clean up his house, and at the end, his house is destroyed, and Homer's <laughs> response is, "It's gonna take a lot of fireworks to clean this up." <laughs> <laughs> no. you this tried and you failed what did we learn never. never try <laughs> true enough all right besides uh, OneDrive, anything else going on let's see uh do, 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 do. doing some more powershell scripting these days reporting on alerts in sharepoint that's all fun. If somebody's asking, it's kind of a simple question. Um, Georgie is asking, is it possible to get automated notifications about company employees' birthdays? Um, if they're on a SharePoint calendar and you set an alert, yeah. Well, it depends how you answer it. I mean, that's a lot of confidential information you want to access. And do you really want to know when your employees' birthdays are? Well, I mean, that might obligate you to a card or something. Yeah, but it also obligates them to bring in food. So True. it's donut day at that point. You're right, Mike. Can't argue with that. It's part of my aversion therapy. So mm -hmm. <laughs> medically required. But really, that by the way. Forgot to ask. Go ahead. Go ahead. What's that, Riz? I was just asking Buckley how that therapy is going for him. I've not tried it yet. I'm, I'm, but I'm planning to sign up. We're looking for no, the, I meant the, the other therapies, you know, the, the yeah. <laughs> He's got a few, he's got a couple that he, you know, you look well, that's all that matters, buddy. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll send out the weekly update okay. uh, later this morning of my therapy, Eric. So thank you for asking. <laughs> we love you. Yeah. And what's your t-shirt? He's got his own yeah. calendar. for. Therapy. Yeah, that's right. So this is, you know, I think you've seen this before, it's uh, for the Green Dragon. So this is uh, when I visited Hobbiton um, down south east of uh, Auckland, New Zealand. East of and uh, yeah, I could have spent there. Uh, it's one of those times where, wait, let's see, if, if having a coffee in the morning doesn't wake you up, try deleting table and production database instead. Yes. <laughs> Who has had that experience first thing in the morning? Cheers. It's a zinger. It's a zinger. That's for sure. Yeah. It's a real world example, though. It is a career limiting move. <laughs> it has the potential to certainly be one. Yes. If they know that it was you. Yes. And there is no backup. Audit all the logs. Oh, wait, they were logged in as SA. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I worked for, for a company that had all of their portfolio management all the project management of, of about 180 PMs and analysts being done in uh, one Excel spreadsheet that had shared access. Oh, God. And that sounds like a good idea to no one. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> this was a long time ago and an older like, version of Excel and the galaxy far, far away. Still not uh, a good idea back then. We knew it was a bad idea when it was happening, but. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know when that would ever be considered a good idea. 
Let's see. Uh, any other questions that have popped up? Does anybody know much about Intune? I used to do a lot of work when it first came out, but they, they really changed that around. What was What's the question? Uh, when it comes to an easy migration of mobile devices to Intune and conditional access in the first step, add the mobile devices as hybrid AD is, is an uh, AD de op uh, add the mobile devices as hybrid AD devices is an option. But is there an option to allow mobile devices just by MAC address? No, because most mobile devices don't have MAC addresses. Um, they have the, you know, they have the IMEIs and uh, the uh, SIDs. But anyways, uh, you know, they've really changed Intune, and now it's all part of the authentication, you know, the device authentication. And I think the the first part of that question is really kind of there's no easy way to migrate. Uh, mobile devices onto the platform. I mean, regardless of what Microsoft says, um, but it all has to do with, you know, how you do your MDM and, uh, you know, that whole strategy behind it. So, yeah. but no, you can't do it. There is no such thing as a Mac um, on a mobile device. Now, if they're talking iPads, uh, you know, is it coming over cellular or is it coming over Wi-Fi? Because in Intune, you can do computers and, and iPads and, you know, Android devices, if that's what they're talking about, okay? Um, you know, no, because it's all it's all user authentication. There's a device authentication, but that's based off of a, an actual GUID, an actual SSID, or not an SSID, and a, a, a SID. So, I don't okay. think so. My, my final answer, I don't think so. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, so I've got a broad question. I think there'd be some interesting discussion around, possibly, if uh, if Eric has anything good to say. Um, Actually, Christian, I was just going to take this back to a question from last week. Oh, like, <laughs> that. that's right. That is your thing. Okay. What are, what did we uh, gloss over last time? Our avid listeners, you know that I like to refer back to things that happened two weeks ago. Did you see how I called you out on that in the notes in the uh, blog post? <laughs> I did. I, I really appreciated that too. It was, it was great. No, I, this I, I had nothing there. I just wanted to bother you. Oh, I, oh, I know. Yeah. You are vexing. Yes. Yeah, I've never. I, I'm getting to like this guy. <laughs> Christian. Oh, don't. Very well give it now. a little time. Give it a little time, Mike. Yeah. He'll grow on you, then you'll scratch it off like a uh, like it's like a scab that doesn't <laughs> quite ever heal. <laughs> One of those warts that. You know, kind of grows yeah. back. That's right. More of the wart. It's it's that hardened Sist. skin, no, dead no, skin. No, no, really yeah. yeah. We all. Um, <laughs> what, what Christian is trying to say is that we all have our talents and <laughs> our place here on the panel, and we all bring specific expertise that we're happy to provide to the community, like Works super friends. Yeah. Super friends. Yeah. X fact. Yeah. The yeah the mutant X something. All right. So David asked the question. Uh, like one or more who use, I would like one or more who use OneNote in their business, tell me how they use it and for what purpose. So business cases, how are people using OneNote? I can tell you that I got uh, a couple of customers that are actually sharing. I mean, shared notebooks is a big thing. Um, I have a county <clears throat> government, actually, that their whole basis of their documentation, believe this or not, is OneNote notebooks. Um, it's a, it's a sad thing to say, but when you think about it, it's actually SharePoint in the back end, right? So, you know, they have other means to access that data. Now they're just discovering that they were putting it in one note. They had the shared notebooks. Now they are going into SharePoint going, Oh, Hey, we can look at this in SharePoint. We can look at it, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, uh, definitely shared notebooks is a big thing. Um, I use it. Uh, I use it, do a lot of handwriting. I have a surface, so. I love the handwriting recognition of, of OneNote. Um, from a business perspective, when I'm in meetings, I'd rather I can write faster than I can type. So, In the consulting biz, I can also say that um, many consulting companies, uh, anytime you work for a client and you're trying to share notes, uh, you may have, not that this is best practice, but um, you may have shared logins and things like that. Uh, that sort of information goes great in OneNote, as well as 
um, whenever you're meeting with someone, uh, whiteboard capture is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because OneNote, you can bring that into OneNote, take a picture of a whiteboard, it'll OCR the text. Um, since, since we don't have the proper whiteboard yet, and I don't know when they're doing, I know a lot of people are asking for the expansion of that of that tool to make it a uh, co-collaborating, you know, a, a Teams experience and not just a Windows experience. But yeah, OneNote, that's a great example. Yeah, that's Office cool. the Office Lens tool uh, works great with OneNote too. That's I've seen some companies using, uh, consulting companies using OneNote for all of their best practices. Their full lifecycle um, implementation practices are all sitting in OneNote. And every time somebody has to reference uh, a document, uh, a line item, something for a project plan. Um, you know, it, it's all sitting in OneNote, and it, it's all it's all changeable and and dynamic with a particular organization or project. You, you know, one of the things that I loved is when Outlook, uh, as part of a new meeting creation, added the OneNote. And initially, as an add-on, it's kind of the standard thing now. But the yeah. ability to go out and uh, and to when you so I have it on by default and then select between shared notes and personal. So if it's something one on one and it's just me that needs to look at it, being able to capture that, just make it part of the standard template is the way that I run meetings and capture that information. Um, but those shared assets, I mean, for every one of my clients, I have a, you know, a, 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 you know set up a, a whole OneNote uh, infrastructure. And so meeting notes and ideas and uh, you know, keep a running log of every interaction with those clients all in, in OneNote. So it's, uh, I often say I live inside of OneNote on a daily basis. Yeah. Hey, Al. Hey, Al. Hi there. How's every little thing? Good. How cool is it in Arizona right now? Cool. Uh, well, let me see exactly. Um, I heard it's going to be like 105 there today. Ryan A. Cool. In Phoenix. So uh, they're predicting it at 104. Uh, current is 88. Just just short of 90. Yeah. I love that dry heat. Yeah. And from the looks of it, it's going to be that way all week, though. I do see some clouds showing up on Wednesday for precipitation chance zero. Instantly vaporizing those. Clouds. Zero. And that is next the weather Tuesday, given by how? Oh, 10%. <laughs> we might see some. It's actually 10% next Thursday and Tuesday and Wednesday. <laughs> Meteorologist, how? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> one thing I did want to bring back on the OneNote thing is I found out something last week that really bothers the bo <laughs> it, 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 it Just aggravates. Aggravate. And the and thing is, is that I was using OneNote and I was copying and pasting text. This is just off of a uh, a notepad document, right? And it had a link in it. And OneNote has this really annoying, they call it a feature, but it's really annoying, is that whenever you paste a link into it and OneNote identifies it as a link, you can't remove that link. Even though you don't want it linked, you can't remove it. It doesn't allow you to you do mean, that. So what it, what it does is that you add the link, it'll actually paste in uh it'll the title of the link that you're pasting in or if, if you just want a url the url it'll, it'll put the title and then it'll put the in the image of the page of so as an example i i created a a, a, a listing of steps to do in order to accomplish something you know inside of a, a, a router and it was the steps to take and in order to do that one of them is you have to download this code from this website so it does a wget, um, and it's a single command line, and it has the URL at the end. OneNote, for whatever reason, will not allow me to take that link off of that text. And I looked it up online, and it seems like it's just a big thing that's been going on for years. It's been on user voice, is that Microsoft will not take this feature off, is that OneNote actually scans your documents that are inside of your in inside of your notebooks and it looks for links like that and it'll automatically hyperlink it'll it, turn it to blue text and it'll hyperlink it and you can't remove it. Hmm. It just makes little sense to me, but part of a value add. Yeah. Yeah. I 
I was going to say that, so the one way that you can remove the the rest of the added, because it's annoying to me when I'm just trying to capture a URL that it does that little conversion. But if you yeah. hit the back button once, it will undo that addition and just leave your URL. But it's still, as you point out, it's still a hypertext link. Yeah. I didn't realize that you can't remove that. I've never tried. I've tried changing the font. I've tried changing it to... Um, you know, uh, change the formatting because you can you have an option to select code. Uh, so you can do it comes out as code formatting. I think it uses Consolas font or something like that. But it, it does and it still links it, even though it's you know, <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, well, I've noticed that in, like in, in Word, I mean, you can you can go in and it can remain a hypertext link and yet you can remove the underline, change it to black or whatever the color of the rest of your text. Yeah. So you can so make it look formatting. like anything else, but the link is still there when you float over. But yes, you can't do that in, in OneNote. So. Not that advanced. Yeah. Advanced in so many well, ways. The but... thing about that is, is that you can actually change the hyperlink. If you have a given URL listed here, you can actually change the site to which it links you can modify the link you just can't remove it yeah well and the problem is is when you when you when i deliver this document to someone who doesn't you know it's a it's a process document that's given to a customer and when i deliver it to them they copy and paste it and it copy and paste with that hyperlink yeah and that hyperlink doesn't go anywhere because it's you know it's got to be it's part of a process and it, it it's just kind of a pain. It really is because I always get questions about it. They're always like, "Well, I click on this and it doesn't take me." Any well, no, it's not supposed to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess if you're if you're if you got the documentation, one way around that is to, uh, if, especially if it's like an internal, uh, you know, it's only only you can follow that link and uh, to replace the URL, the written URL with the title of the document that they can't do, get to, so they right. at least they understand it's something that they don't have access to. And I've even tried a suggestion on the web, which was to uh, save it as a PDF. And in form in, in previous OneNote, uh, I think it was OneNote 2013 or something, when you saved it as PDF, it took the, you could strip those links out because the PDF didn't show it as a link. Now in OneNote 2016 or 2019, whatever I'm using, um, I don't use the Windows 10 version because I don't like the Windows 10 version, but the desktop version, um, you do a save as PDF, and the link comes right along with it, and it's a clickable link in that PDF. So, yeah. Yeah, Hal, we're we're sharing uh, other like business cases for using OneNote. Ah, yes. Yeah. But it's uh, and then of course uh, you know the other thing of uh, it, so it's it's fairly common within uh, Microsoft Teams usage. Uh, most organizations, you know, have. Uh, don't use the wiki functionality, the formally uh, right. built-in wiki capability. And the big push was stop automatically the creation of a new team, adding a wiki, that, and then not let me remove it. And then yeah. they allowed you to remove it, and they stopped shipping with that, but it's uh, or provisioning with that. But OneNote has become, uh, I, I think... Um, used a bit more, I, I don't have numbers to, to defend that other than just people talking about using OneNote more because of that. Well, uh, I, and I was an Evernote convert, right? So I used Evernote for years, literally years, because OneNote, the early OneNotes, to be honest, weren't that great. <laughs> mm -hmm. I could do better just, you know, saving Word documents at that point. But uh, yeah, I was an Evernote convert, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was I was pretty much always a never a OneNote person. I uh, I got into OneNote way back when the XP Tablet Edition came out. I just had to have me a tablet, so I wound up with a uh, Motion M fourteen hundred slate. And lo and behold, I discovered I could uh, I could take that thing, fire up OneNote, uh, go into any kind of an engineering machine meeting that I had, turn the thing portrait, to whip out the stylus and play like I had an engineering pad. I even had a template, which I still have, of an engineering pad that I use for that. <laughs> and it, it it was pretty neat. I mean, it saved me thousands and thousands and thousands of sheets of paper that I drew pictures and wrote text and, and diagrams and stuff like that on, and all became a OneNote file. It, I can't tell you what a wonderful thing that was. Yeah. 
They've got a question here um, from, so on the live stream. If for anybody that's watching the live stream, feel free to ask uh, any questions there. And I'm, I'm checking back on a regular basis uh, to see if anything has been posted. Uh, but Khalil asks, uh, hi, I want to remove my on-premises uh, exchange and only use exchange online. But my problem is that I have some billing servers sending emails from exchange relay, uh, not internet facing any solution that you advise. I don't know if you guys have anything on that. Go ahead. Wow. So that was one of the big things is that uh, I helped a customer. Uh, I do I do a lot with with government and uh, the local county, uh, uh, not a county government, a local municipality. They had to do the same thing, and they had like three or four things. And it was specifically around when homeowners would uh, uh, request permits and dog licenses and things like that, and they would send these automated emails um, through uh, exchange um, but the problem is is that they had to go to a third party in order to accomplish that and the reason is because in order to continue to do that you can't do that with online exchange that's not it's not possible to uh, do that they don't and Microsoft doesn't allow that they could allow it but uh, they don't so they had to go to a third party solution um, in order to just do that relay and there are a couple of uh, third party solutions will intercept that mail or you send it to a specific email address and they will be part of, uh, you know, attach your domain to it. And it'll look like it, it came from from, you know, your exchange that's up in the cloud, but it really came from, you know, from them. <clears throat> um, the, uh, the, you know, in order to, to, to have it come from the same, they actually had to keep a DAG on premises, you know, and just to do that SMTP relay. Um, and that just wasn't, it, it's not fiscally viable to do that because it's, you know, the licensing alone is expensive. And Great, great uh, way to get your IP blocked as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that, that's the only way that, that could solve that problem. I've only had one experience with it. That's when I learned all about how Microsoft says, no, we're not going to allow this. A lot of people have asked for it on user voice um, to allow that type of relay to happen because they could do it on premises. Why can't they do it in the cloud? Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's about the only way to go third party that I'm aware of. There are um, third party services as add-ins as well in the environment out in uh, Office 365. Will it work in the cloud though? Those add-ins will work? I, I'm not aware of that. Yeah, there are some that are set up specifically as cloud providers. Oh, okay. Um, I'm, I can't think of a name right now, but there are at least a handful of them because that need is very big for a lot of organizations, as you point out. I've got a couple other um, Outlook email related questions here. Um, one of these, um, I think I know the, the short answer to this, but uh, um, Paul's asking, is there a way to get a warning if an email is sent to someone not in my contact list? And so basically it goes on and says, look, I've received a lot of email that includes other people that are not part of his distribution, not part of his contacts. Um, so when I start to type a name, other people show up as potential contacts and I inadvertently send an email to the wrong person. Um, is there a way for the so for for Outlook to to restrict that? So the only people that you know, automatically pop up is are those people that are in your contact database? I'd have to refer that to you, Office folk. <laughs> yeah, Eric, you're shaking your head no, because I, I, I think the same thing. I think no. My understanding is if you, if there's been an interaction, if they're in there, if it's being tracked, I'm not aware of any way to restrict <clears throat> that to only the people within your contact database. Yeah, I agree. The only workaround is to be super diligent with the management of the, the drop-down list, the people that, as you say, you've been in touch with. And... If you continually or can continuously delete them, then you're not going to have any mistakes along. I don't think there's anything from a management perspective that will allow that. It's generally considered a feature by most people because start interacting with someone and get that autocomplete. Yeah. When so you go me, to get back to me. Let me ask this from a, a dumb, dumb user point of view of myself on Outlook. Um, you you can you can specify address books, right? 
So would it be just a limitation of what address book to look at? Well, or- no, but but I mean the problem is that if if Mike, you send me an email, mm-hmm. and, and you include Hal, uh, Eric, and Sean's emails as a CC within that, but I'm not connected to them. If I go create a new, because the, that that's been received, it, it, and as I start typing, it okay. will recognize their email. So that's that's the issue. I've often wondered the the same thing. So the complaint is, I mean, I, I wonder about this from like a GDPR standpoint and other standards is that you've got to be careful like now who you're CCing and whether they want to have their, because uh, somebody complained to me, uh, uh, this is uh, like a year or two ago, of having been included on an email that was a community related thing with somebody that they were trying to steer clear of. I'm like, okay, one, how would I ever know that? Two, I, I sent an email. I mean, the, the laws still apply if they're spamming you and you've not uh, intentionally joined their distribution list to be spammed by them, then they're breaking the law. I mean, I, I get this all the time where people are, are adding, I'm on lists somehow, and I imagine this is how I'm on some of these mailing lists. And so I'll go and remove myself and mark you know, it's a pain in the butt to be have to do this, but say I never added myself to this email distribution and block them. And if it's via other, you know, Gmail or other than I report it as spam. And, you know, so do I, I go through that almost daily process of purging that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, I, I, it, it's other times it's been uh, a saving grace where I've not directly connected with somebody, but I've had some through, you know, yeah. community discussion interaction with, but have their email in my system. Yeah, I get a I get a boatload of spam email from, especially from this Buckley Planet place, man. It just it pisses me off to no end. And you know, yeah. <laughs> What's it? It's a tweet jam. I it's the yeah. relentless, totally, positively yeah. relentless. <laughs> I always like to go back. So, you know, we, we complain about this, but I have to tell you, I had a, in my freshman year in college is I, I had a good friend of mine, Brant Looney, who, uh, the, the, the name befits. That's got to be an assumed name. That can't be his real name. (laughs) It's funny. uh, It's funny. It's two of his sisters, uh, were models were, um, uh, uh, just really good looking family, but they were uh, models for years over in Japan. No, but they didn't go by their last name of Looney for some reason. <laughs> That's his Looney. Imagine that. I know. No, what's really funny is uh, he, he served in LDS mission. Uh, one of his first companions, they go by elder. So elder Looney, his first, one of his first companions was elder flake. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. What a pair. Yeah. Which is a big Mormon name. It's a, you know, Snowflake, Arizona isn't named after snowflakes. It's after snow and flake, two families that <laughs> that developed that whole region. But uh, but uh, anyway, yeah. Um, oh, there was one other. So the other one, let me scroll down here. Um, do, 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 do. Now, while you're while you're getting that, I'll just yeah. go because I like doing that Cut. but that would be a that would be a very powerful feature going back to the email and the I'm just thinking being able to restrict that yeah 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 if you could if you just had that option to turn that off and on to say hey only you know only allow those that are already within my address book I had thought also, that I mean gmail has that right so I'm I'm forced I'm forced I mean like hands be time tied behind my back and my you know, I'm forced to use Gmail at certain times, um, and uh, they actually have that option. It says, you know, <clears throat> checkbox, uh, you know, add contacts from replies and forwards and things like that. But um, I'm surprised Outlook doesn't have that. Mm. Yeah, I, you know, maybe it does, and we just none of us know about it. Um, I'm just, I was just checking to see if there were any comments that somebody's like, no, no, you can turn that on. Nobody said that, but. You guys are idiots. What are you doing? Nope. Um, hey, here's another one um, around email signatures. Um, it says, I want to set up an email signature for an entire organization uh, from one place for all staff. I tried to use Office Exchange settings. 
uh, but it does not allow to insert company logo, position of each employee, and text formatting. And uh, so does anybody have a solution that they've used? I've used a third party solution at two different uh, two different uh, places of employment um, that will, you know, you can just Google it, but they will actually uh, allow you to do exactly what you just said. Uh, Same here. Right, right. And part of the problem is, is that he just one of the things that they mentioned was they wanted each individual person's title. Right. So when they would each individual <clears throat> Uh, AD user would have to go out to this service and then, you know, that would have to tie into your AD in order for that to read what the title is. But uh, through through exchanges own, own mechanisms, I'm not aware of how to, you know, yeah, to Ma that. Mike, you can name third party. It was like, we're, we're fine with with uh, if, so if there's anything that you uh, recommend. So, yeah. So there was one uh, I can look it up. Uh, the one I just used. Um, uh, let me look it up here. So the one I'm a fan of is, and it was mentioned, somebody else responded, was Exclaimer. Um, and it's really powerful. It's it, I, So you could be, I think for a lot of organizations, uh, email, uh, the, the signature file, is it's a um, often uh, left unused uh, marketing tool as well. What's, what's brilliant about some of these third-party solutions. So I think we're all agreed, unless anybody has any hidden knowledge about things that you can do in out of the box exchange but right. i believe the answer is no you cannot do that just yeah. as they've identified but a lot of these third-party solutions not very expensive uh are fantastic what's great about that is that you can go in there with a product again my experience is with exclaimer and, and i've i've worked with them a couple times and so they're, they've been a repeat customer but i just really like their pro i was a fan of the product before I started working with the company. Um, but what's really cool about a solution like that is being able to go and centrally manage. So if you as a company are, for example, sponsoring three events at different parts of the world, that you can actually by geo set up so that the banner, the signature files include uh, you know, a, a artwork, a JPEG for the regionally corresponding event and have everybody's signature files look identical, and yet you centrally can manage, you know, what you're advertising for your company or these special events or whatever in the footers of all of your employees, um, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it actually, uh, the one I was thinking of was, uh, uh, and, and, and this really ties into the Active Directory part, is part of, if, you, if your company uses Salesforce. So Salesforce has a mechanism built in um, that allows you to, because you're already tied into AD with Salesforce, um, to be able to create those signatures. Um, Constant Contact, I know, allows you to do that as well from a marketing standpoint. And then the one I used when I was with uh, another company uh, was called, I think it was Wise, like Wise, Wise Creator or Wise, no, Wise Stamp. That's what it was. Um, so, you know, Wise Stamp would allow you to, you know, create uh, your own signatures and do multiples, like you said, Christian, be able to work. You could have like three or four that you could pick from. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that? Hal, you look like you're on on the verge of saying something, adding to that. <laughs> uh, not saying something, adding to that. I'm thinking something to, to say to my, my surface here that's giving ah. me some tweets this morning. Sorry. Hell's a multitasker. He's got like 10 things going on at one time. So we're never really sure if he's he's with us or he's, you know, off doing something. <laughs> uh, that was, well, and I say that with all the love, Al. I do. <laughs> Why, thank you. Is there any other way to say that? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there's. Uh, I, I was just gonna say that as kind of a gentle knock on Riz, um, is not just Eric uh, <laughs> who is bringing up topics that, that we've already answered and moved away from and emotionally disengaged ourselves from. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, so there, so we see repeat of a few questions that are out here. I, I just see this question was posted on the third. Um, from Bucky saying, uh, I want to remove a domain from an Office 365 subscription for use as a domain in another totally different Office 365 subscription. 
Typically, how long does it take for the changes to propagate? 48 hours, seven, 48 to 72 hours. Yeah, Stella. Okay. If you're using yeah. if you're using the service, I just did this. Uh, I do a lot of mass changes on domains. Uh, I have found some of the domain providers, the registrars, um, are actually quicker than others. Like GoDaddy takes forever, right? Yeah. Where Google domains and Namecheap, they are like, you know, Namecheap's like three hours, four hours, and it's changed. You know, Google domains is like six or eight hours, and it's done. So. Yeah, you're at the victim of the DNS provider a lot of times because of, you know, uh, time to live for those records varies from provider to provider. Yeah, and it, you know, there's a, there's a few comments on here. Somebody said, Eric says, uh, also make sure your DNS records are set to expire in say five minutes. So yeah. Get cashed for a day or two. Yeah, careful, set them back after you're done or else yeah, yeah. The, some of those name server police will come after you and say, uh, that's a no-no. <laughs> yeah, might end up. That was actually me that wrote that. I just wanted to get in ahead of the comments. <laughs> That's right. End up generating a lot of uh, traffic you don't want. <clears throat> oh, here's interesting. Here's it's a roundabout SharePoint question. Um, Chad says, uh, "Hi, I'll just throwing this out here to see if anyone has run into this before." We had a user who was licensed with E5. She lost her license and then it was given back. There was an, an expected pause in functionality. Now everything works perfect except SharePoint, which impacts OneDrive, Teams files, et cetera, both desktop client and web version. When signing in, there is an error that the user doesn't exist in the SharePoint directory. If you look at her user account, you can see her OneDrive set up with content. It just won't let her in. License has been back for maybe 12 hours. Does the resync take longer? Uh, that's going to really depend um, because with SharePoint. Wait, wait, the SharePoint question, an the answer to that question is it depends? <laughs> yeah, I imagine that. Wow. Yeah. But with SharePoint, there's a SharePoint keeps a keeps its own mapping of users to um, accounts and so a user in SharePoint is mapped to an active directory or another source account but there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one. and if that user ends up getting deleted from SharePoint or removed and then you add them back with a different for instance SID in active directory they're going to have two different entries in SharePoint and so the reason it depends is because if they are in there as two different users, they are going to look the same, but it's actually two different accounts. So that's that's Oops. a problem. Yeah, um, there are there were ways on prem I know of um, getting that users table <clears throat> back in line if you wanted to consolidate it. Um, in the cloud, I don't know what the options are. You might want to look at the uh, SharePoint admin commandlets for PowerShell to see if there's anything about consolidating users by login. And I would bet you'd be able to, uh, that'd be a support ticket. I bet your support could do that on the back end. That's was my, going to be my suggestion. That sounds like a support ticket thing. Yeah, so the, if, if that's the case. There's been a lot of that. There have been a couple of MVPs I've seen that have had E3 accounts and of course you get an E5 as part of your benefits and trying to get those swapped back and forth and the there's some gyrations that have to go to, to, to go with that but uh, in this case this, this this sounds like a ticket yeah all you lucky people that get E5s I hate you <laughs> Yeah, the the uh, well, the, yeah. The one thing I keep asking for is that you know, with all that, with the E5, with all the other the perks, the MVP perks, um, I, I would like a project license, but I've not found anybody that that has that. I don't think the project people have it as a perk. Project I mean, of my existence. Project online. Yeah, project online. Huh. No, I don't know. He has a separate license, so no, I keep. I'm asking, but. Uh, I, I've asked in the team, and it just gets uh, kicked around. But I, I don't believe it's a, 
it's a perk anyone out there so anyway um no the uh i was going to say like another uh, did how that person's license was removed or paused or whatever could also determine that so are they still in the system exactly. were they completely removed um uh, you know that would be expected behavior to come back and have a second profile if they were removed um even for a short while and you know let, if, if it was just paused if uh it just the license is expired. I, you know, again, agree with you guys. If the disconnect is there, talk to support. They should be able to fix it. But if there was a, if they were removed from the system, dele deleted as a user in any way, then let me let me ask you a question then, because in in AD you have a recycle bin. So yep. if you delete a user, that user actually isn't deleted unless they're specifically purged. You know, right. or Let's that's what I'm saying. It's like we don't know, like yeah. when they say removed, like so there's a number of different factors. That's exactly <clears throat> my point. Yeah. Yeah, because I have so for all of the the grad students that I that I use um, for research projects, and I just uh, I remove licenses, but they're still in my system. Yeah. Uh, and so I've worked with a couple of them repeatedly, and so I just reactivate um, when they're working on those projects. Yeah, another reason, another great point why you want to disable someone, not delete them. Right. Typically from an Active Directory or, you know, in this case, SharePoint. <laughs> Excuse me. And I had one situation where folks were like, they didn't understand. They they were using the old sync, you know, AD, AD sync between on-premises and 365. Um, it used to be, you know, back in the early days before it was AD Connect. Anyways, There's yeah. Exactly. And yeah, what happened was is that they were like, oh, if we delete them on premises, oh, we deleted this user accidentally on premises. Oh, well, their account's still going to be in 365. I'm like, no. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, That's with a totally awesome. different ID. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that means what you think it means. No. Um, again, if there's anybody that's watching, we've got another uh, 15 minutes. If you've got questions that you'd like us to try and tackle, feel free to uh, to ask. We've got about a, got a, a dozen or more people watching in a couple locations. Um, so feel free if you've got questions, let us know. Anything else you guys have run across? Any other discussion points? Hmm. About other than Xbox in the case of the missing aliases, no. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? No, it's a, it's a, it's a case of where uh, someone gets an Xbox. Uh, someone puts a, a kid's account into that Xbox. The kid starts using the Xbox. The kids decide they don't want the parent's account in the Xbox, so they remove the parent's account from the Xbox, <laughs> which in turn removes the Microsoft account, and suddenly parents mailboxes aren't <laughs> wow yeah be careful definitely. how much access you give <laughs> there's there there's an issue going with that there are theoretically bear in mind i don't have an xbox and i've not tried this uh but there has been considerable discussion in the answers forums and so forth about about uh, how do i recover my mailboxes because my kid deleted it Wow, you know, and it's I, uh, it's and there's no real good way about it because they they come with big warnings, warning you know, deleting this from here deletes it from everywhere, and that yeah. somehow gets ignored or not seen or not understood, um, and uh, the result is a mess. Uh, that the <laughs> there example. are some things that Microsoft can do to bring that mailbox back. There are things that they can't do. The lesson and here being if you have children and you want them to use your Xbox, add them, first of all, make sure that child is set up in a child-parent relationship um, through Microsoft systems, because then you get parental controls and all sorts of things. Yeah. But then, you know, when you add them to the Xbox, you know, that account will go through and carry the, the permissions through. Your kid, if, you're, <laughs> if your kid is wiping out your account, They've got a few too many permissions. I, yeah. I didn't realize that 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 that, uh, that could happen with an Xbox. I mean, I would imagine 
that is, you know the so one who is going in and managing their exchange account their overall account through their xbox well that's a default of an xbox that's the default and, yeah if you go into an xbox you can you you can go in and you can look at your uh, microsoft I, uh, I either microsoft id or your work or school um you know login and you can you can manage that inside of an xbox so with the removal, something like that via, again, I, I mean, I look at, I use my Xbox not as a computer for other things. It's a predominantly a gaming and entertainment device. Right. Uh, and and I would assume like the expected behavior would be there'd be some kind of warning through my normal channels, through the devices that I use. Mm -hmm. Remember this this you know, intelligent systems we're trying to move towards to say, hey, did you intend for this to happen? Somebody through this gaming system has tried to delete your profile and there needs to be some multi-step that needs to be authenticated. What what, what happened to MFA? What about, you know, the, the parents? What if the parents, what if the parents the getting that, notified? Yeah, what if the parents gave the child uh, admin rights? You know, that's just it. I mean, from an admin perspective, you can go out and delete an account. The account owner yeah. doesn't get notified. But if somebody, yeah, so again, this is. I and just, these are home accounts, Christian. Yeah. 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 Bear in mind, not work. So if they logged in, if my child logged in as me to delete that, yeah, there's nothing you could do about that. But if it's another account deleting, you know, someone else's account, again, I, I, I would expect that I get some notification on, no. on my device. No, nope, because I, hey, I can go in and delete my son's account because yeah. it's a family, right? Because you, you you have the whole family concept with the <clears throat> soft IDs. You can create a family. Yep. If you create that family. You know, my wife and I have the admin permissions. I can go delete my son's account. He never knows that that account is deleted. Right. Well, see that, and that's the difference. And and my kids are set up as that. You know, I'm the admin as well. They do not have those rights. Right. And then they pester me. It's like, hey, can you also do the give me this or let me do this? And, yeah. and then the answer's simple. No. <laughs> the real fun begins. How I, much does I something like that pay? That's another phrase <laughs> I use. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but, you know, my kids have gotten older since these counts were first established. But all of our children have gotten older, Sean. What's your point? It, it tends Wait, to happen. I know. I, I know it tends to happen, but um, as they get older... Public? For a while and you, <laughs> right and you try to um you know they go back and you're they're at the point like my kids uh are 13 now <clears throat> so they've kind of hit that 13 year old milestone and we're allowing them to do many things they weren't allowed to do previously and <clears throat> you lo load certain games on their computer and suddenly they can't do certain things like join friends online or play along with you tracking down those permissions is sometimes a real journey um because you know six years or seven years after you set them up <laughs> it's like oh man where do i need to go to do this and for the xbox i know recently because i did this my um i set my son up with uh minecraft dungeons and we were trying to play together and he could not see me online he couldn't join me even though we were friends and i had to make a specific change to his xbox permissions in his account to allow that to happen even though we were playing the pc version so the one thing that bothered me about the xbox is that the person who logs in that login it always logs in you power the xbox off three years later you power that xbox on it'll automatically log in that user so if the password hasn't changed for that user it'll it'll automatically log in even though that user you know hasn't done anything in three years because my oldest son stopped using Xboxes, switched to PS, you know, PlayStations. He came back to the Xbox. He used his old ID, um, you know, and turned on the turned on his old Xbox, uh, and boom, logged in as him. He hadn't used it for years. Hmm. He didn't even have. To, he didn't even remember his password, but he didn't have to because it just logged him in. It's <laughs> interesting because I mean, we've got uh, each of us in the family has. Uh, it's we've got our own profiles. We power on our Xbox and no one's logged in. But there's only one profile on the box. There was oh. only one profile. So it was an individual. It was his Xbox. And it was there was no no one else that used that. So there wasn't <laughs> multiple logins or profiles, just his. Interesting. 
I just think from a security standpoint, that eh, kind of blows. But you know. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, I I've got my profile password protected through the controller, or I've got a control sequence that maps to you know characters, whatnot. And every time we log in to use the Plex server, I've got to punch in my profile. My wife has her own password and whatnot, so I'll get access, and that you know. I'm me when I'm in the system, but uh, and for, <laughs> it's kind of funny because the Xbox is frequently recognizing my wife uh, when we sit down, we have movie night, we're having dinner. It's like, hi, Tracy. She's the only one who gets that. What's going on? What's up, Connect? You looking at my wife? Come on. <laughs> She's the only one who gets that. Sean, have you had a chance to watch Time Bandits yet? No, I'm afraid not, Christian. Twelve Monkeys. I had seen Twelve Monkeys, but I haven't had a chance to rewatch it. Okay, yeah, I just I watched it as you probably know, you know, uh, like uh, right after you put it on there on Plex again. So, yeah, just another fantastic movie. It's funny we talked about this briefly. I said, but I was never, I never understood why Brad Pitt was so popular. It was that movie that made just like, man, he's a really good actor. Um, it's just like, uh, what's eating Gilbert grape with, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, it's just, he's an, just an incredible actor from that movie. I was a fan. Um, but, uh, yeah, anyway, classic. So, all right. Uh, in the waning moments, um, uh, Wes is complaining about something. Wes is always complaining about something. What is he? Uh, <laughs> Wes. Yeah, no, he's he's just commenting on the Xboxes. It seems like it picks a favorite. Um, so it's <laughs> our Xbox greets Connor to his son every time. So oh, is Wes Preston? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yep. Where's Liam? Eyes at Connor, Wes. I'd be looking at that Xbox. Yeah. <clears throat> Christian, no messages from Liam today. I'm very disappointed. Is he still on the road? I don't know if he's home or. On the road, he was like, yeah, he was dropping in, like sitting at the Denver airport or something last week. So yeah, yeah he was passing the time watching us. So at the airport, he's home. He's probably catching up with work now. Still too busy to join us. Too good for us, that's for sure. <laughs> probably no place that's got decent bandwidth. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, I don't see anything else. Anything else coming up? Is there, uh, I, you know, I'm just thinking that I had, um, so I had to back out of the um, ECS in Germany in October due to family stuff since they pushed it back from the live event to the live event in the fall. Um, but the European SharePoint 0365 and Azure conference, which was going to be in Amsterdam in November, got canceled. Yeah. Just canceled, not yeah, not, canceled. Scheduled, not rescheduled. They're canceled. going to be doing uh, Nice, France next year, October next year. Um, so it's uh, is there anything else? Is Rackley's event still happening? The North American Collaboration Summit. Yeah, as far as I know. Last I saw it was, but who knows? I think that's going to go on, Riz. <clears throat> He's going to do it. Anybody going? No one. I'm driving down. I was supposed to go, but I've got. Uh, we'll have to check the quarantine rules because I, yeah. I can't go down and then get stuck back in Canada for 14 days under quarantine. Yeah, that would kind of suck. That's in but, September. Which is not Rackley. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, it's in Branson in September, and that event. It's worth noting, anyone who might be attending or thinking of attending, <clears throat> that's one event. Population density down there is low really? enough that social yeah. distancing can be a reality. Um, yeah. And I'm counting on that, especially as somebody who's driving down there. Uh, so I don't have the the plane thing to worry about. Yeah, that convention center is massive and they've got the the entire upstairs space. And so, yeah, you're you're right. I mean, if you're if you're concerned about that. Um, I, again, you wear a mask and gloves and you're going to have no problem sitting six feet surrounded you know, by all these other people. There's plenty of space there. Yeah. 
Sean, you mentioned driving. Do you have to park a certain number of spots away from the next car? <laughs> How do you manage that? Um, yeah, that's a good point. I don't know. Every, is every other space in the garage going to be open? I don't know. I've been driving around with pylons in my car. I just park, and then I put pylons in the next two spots on your side. It's really effective. I was out walking the dogs this morning, and I see a guy where we live uh, – you know, a, a five minute bike ride away, 10 minute bike ride away from the kind of the tech hub uh, uh, here of Le- Lehigh. So across the river from Thanksgiving Point and and uh, guy riding his. Uh, so he's dressed for work on his mountain bike, the backpack and a, and a full mask. There, there's nobody, nobody. I was 200 feet away as he's riding by on his bike and he's wearing the mask <laughs> and uh, people his part. don't. That makes no sense. Uh, <laughs> you can remove the mask during the ride, and then when you get to the destination, you know, put it back on. It's it's I'm not okay. Getting into that with you because uh, <clears throat> I have I have a relative that uh, was actually born in in uh, Japan, and uh, that was something that they've been doing all their lives. I mean, wherever they go, because they they don't want to get anybody sick from anything. That they have they even have a cold you also have the smog in that city so there's mm-hmm. different reasons for there is there is but part of that's part of their culture is that if they're sick they don't want to get anybody else sick so they wear masks and, and even if there is nobody a mile away from them they're still wearing that mask so <laughs> yeah yeah to each each their own you yeah. know but uh you know it's it's our jobs to point out those freaks <laughs> <laughs> Freaks, geeks, and weirdos. What about Christian's therapy? <laughs> All right. Yeah, I need to go do my research on the uh, donut aversion therapy. I will report back oh, this boy. evening. So, Looking okay. forward to that. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining. And uh, for those, so we are at uh, 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. Pacific every Monday. So feel free to join us for this evening, where we'll be, again, the evening in the, Mer- the Americas or uh, in, around Asia Pacific. Um, so it's our APEC time. But... We'll see everybody back. And if you're going to join us, bring an item. Yeah. I, same I, bad time, same bad channel. That's right. All I've right. read through kind of everything in here. You know, we could go through the, there's always a, a plethora of questions out on the Microsoft Teams community and Facebook. So we might be doing a lot of Teams talk this evening. So, All right, gents. Thanks a lot. Yep. Good day. Have yep. a good yep. rest of the day, guys. Good day, everybody. Bye. Take, Take care. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. All right, and we're live with uh, part two of the, what do we say, this is 16th, 17th, I don't know. Something like that. Whatever the episode is. Hal, you're looking very high-tech today. Yes, that's the radio equipment I'm sitting in the radio room. If I were to turn the camera 180 degrees, you'd see that very same setup Uh, with a few bits Uh, and bits of paper around of it that that one didn't have. I will say that I, my recommendation, I believe the last time I made was that what you need is like that, that the flux capacitor buzzing back there. And mm. uh, then you'd have the perfect setup. Yeah. Well, the trouble, the trouble with that is to be specific from my point of view, uh, once upon a time, I built a thing called the Jacob's ladder. You, uh, are you familiar with those? I've seen the movie. Yeah, well, (laughs) you've seen it in Boris Karloff films and things like that. Basically, what they have is two long rods in a V shape. uh, And uh, down at the bottom, there's a third little button sticking up right at the apex of the V. The two aren't aren't connected. uh, And then then you hook that up off to a something like a neon sign transformer. And what happens is it's a continual arc. It starts at the bottom, and the heat of the arc draws it up. Yeah, draws it up the uh, the, the wires till it gets too thin, and it breaks off. And another one comes down the bottom, and it's a just a continual flowing arc, a Jacob's ladder. I loved it's that kind of stuff as a kid. I, I want know, a science fair with that. And of there. course, got myself into a buttload of trouble with it too, because. Uh, this was uh, me, junior high, coming into high school, and this was a science fair, and I built this Jacob's ladder, and I, you know, you know unfortunately, we had we had a a, a fairly Doppler uh, 
high school classman who was out there vying real hard for the Darwin Award for that particular year, um, who you know looked at it, watched the uh, watched the arc running up and running up in waves up the uh, up the the two metal rods. It's like, is that hot? I said, well, yeah, it's an electric arc. Well, I don't think it's hot. I'm going to touch it. We should have touched it. And of course, it burnt the crap out of me. Oh, you're some kind of smarty aleck, ain't you? I told you it was hot. Oh, you really? Anyway, so I, I heard from him later on when I was a freshman. It's unfortunate, but, you know, science rules. Science rules, folks. I, I loved that kind of stuff as uh, in junior high and high school. Um, I'm trying to remember where I went where there's um, – I can't remember if it was in the U.S. or if it was a, abroad where they had – it wasn't a Jacob's Ladder, but they had the big – you know the, the, the Tesla coils, and it was oh, this, yeah. it was massive, and they caged off the entire space from the viewing area, and uh, and you could safely touch uh, – they you know, there was a – minimal chance of something happening where you could touch the outer cage. Um, but the whole thing, it would, it would arc and spark on the, on the cage, the surround, but it was supposedly, um, safe enough to touch. Uh, yeah. I didn't venture so far, but, uh, you know, I just wanted one of those globe things with the, that you'd touch it and your hair kind of stands up and mm -hmm. you'd get the home versions of those, which are a little bit lighter weight, but I was just always fascinated by those as a kid. Very, 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 very high voltage at, at, at almost no current whatsoever. That's what that actually happens when you rub your kitty cat and, and the touchy's nose. You both get a shock. Well, that's that's at many thousands of volts, but in, the, 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 but the actual arc itself is in, is in microamps or nanoamps or just ridiculously low current. So you say, ouch, instead of you both going up in a ball of flame. Yep. Well, uh, over the course of the day, any other questions pop up that you guys wanted to discuss? Donuts. Yeah, donuts. Yeah, I looked in. I did my research on the topic. And for those that didn't join us uh, that are watching in one of the live streams, uh, I was talking about this morning, one of my favorite radio programs. And just, Sean, he appears Sean, just as donut donuts guy, get mentioned. Just as it gets mentioned. Low, he appears. <laughs> as if by magic. The very sound of the word transgressed across all space and time. I've we been summoned. The <laughs> dimensions. There donuts, uh, that's right. It's it's the uh, it's it's the key to uh, the uh, um, you know the the interdimensional travel that uh, tickle tickle uh, tink. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, it's not that exciting. Uh, I did go and I posted the link up from the uh, up on Facebook from this morning in the the community. Um, so my one of my favorite radio station or radio programs, Armstrong and Getty Morning Guys, uh, were talking about donut aversion therapy, and all the links. Of course, they have the little video of them talking about it and joking about it. But the uh, you know every link, and I went out there just to make sure is this is like a legitimate thing. <laughs> like it's it's you know to see if there was any discussion around it. And the idea of aversion therapy is uh, you know that you it's like a, I my parents tried this with me as a kid. Uh, my older brother didn't work with Halloween candy, which is the eat as much as you can, <laughs> we'll let you just eat as much as you can. And uh, we did just fine. It didn't like turn us off to the candy. My kids, I did the same thing where I, we just said, you know, have as much as you want. They, they get through like, I don't know, like a dozen pieces and they're like, Oh, I'm done. You know, take, take yeah. it away. And I'm just like lightweights. <laughs> yeah really that's that must be my wife's uh dna that 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 weakness that they can't eat more candy in one sitting uh but uh anyway so around donut aversion therapy it was much the same thing it, it there was a lot of links to aversion therapy and there was somebody met that mentioned donuts specifically um but it was you know this idea of eating so many donuts that you'd be sick of eating donuts. I think it would work for like that day, that afternoon. I don't, I don't see that. how it's possible yeah. for it to be ongoing and at work. Well, I've heard stories about folks that have worked in, uh, well, not uh, folks direct, but uh, folks that the uh, people that my, my parents knew that, uh, that 
uh, worked in candy factory. I, it seems to me my mom knew somebody who worked in the Seas candy factory. And the idea there was yeah, just go out and eat as much as you want. And the point of it is, is after a very, uh, certain amount of time, the idea of chocolate makes you absolutely nauseous. So let me so, let me get this straight. If you if you're if you're uh, actually creating something like chocolate, okay. Um, but I'm going to go a little bit. I'm going to stretch that a little bit and go to beer. All right. So craft beer makers, okay. They allow the people to drink as much as they want. Those people are still going to drink beer. I mean, they're not going to get tired of drinking beer. And I mean, uh, you really can't do an aversion. You know, around the aversion therapy, right? I, I, yes, I, that's no. one of my dream yeah, jobs. Yes no. <laughs> See, well, I'm talking with my in, I was talking with my in laws about this this morning. I said, you know, about the donut aversion because they're they're big Armstrong and Getty fans too, being from Sacramento, and uh, we were laughing about that. And I said, you know what this is? This is that's like a what what's missing is the clockwork orange piece. <laughs> <laughs> You yeah. know, like what? What's the version of that with the donut eating? So you have she's so my mother in law. She's like, well, what you need is every time you take a bite of the donut, um, you get somebody zaps you. You know, <laughs> so you start associating that. the physical think, pain. Yeah, that's an association. That, yeah, yeah, trick. Like well, Pavlov. I think that that would that would be aversion therapy for me. <laughs> that's Pavlov's dog, man. I mean, I'd be I'd be all over that. Go ahead, zap me. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna have a good zap. Yeah, yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, sir. May I have another? Thank you, sir. May I have another? <laughs> yeah, because I know I told you guys the story of uh, my time in the, uh, we called it the petting zoo. Uh, One wait, client I had. Be careful how you phrase this now. <laughs> I don't like, remember the story, but oh, no. just from that description, it, it doesn't <laughs> ring a bell. Um, the client that I had, and we were... Um, back in the moss 2007 days and we had gone through a massive implementation and we were in a situation that was after an upgrade we were trying to roll out some new code and so the rollout got started early in the morning and <laughs> the manager at the time brought in donuts because everybody was going to be very busy. I was kept particularly busy because the the code when it rolled out did not go the way it was supposed to. Tried to do all sorts of things to get it up and running um, reliably. Ended up ultimately doing a bunch of binding redirects and web configs and things like that to get it up. But I couldn't go out to eat that day. And so all I had were donuts. Mm. And I shamelessly ate about 18 20 donuts that day oh my goodness Piece to the cake. point yeah to the point where um one of the other consultants across the the table you know because we had this petting zoo arrangement where people would come in it was a bullpen style thing and you know people could come in and visit us and they called it a petting zoo but um <laughs> she was texting people back at her home office she's like my God, he's eating another one. <laughs> yeah, so she had camera phones at that time. She just started taking video and pictures of yeah, it. Yeah, she would have. She would have so definitely we're, done that. We're not going to stay on this whole donut thing for too much longer because you know this is. Oh, well, we could, I guess. You know what the hell? <laughs> anyway, yeah. now you guys ever try those hamburgers that have the donut halves as the bun? No. Yeah, I so there are places though. that serve, they have the glazed donuts that are the top and the bottom bun of a hamburger. And yeah, I've, in, I've seen that. Never it had falls one. apart. It totally falls apart, but it is delicious. <laughs> and, I, you know, sure. I, I have, a, have a, a gut feeling that that concoction, deep fried, it would not only hold it together, I think it would be even more delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Just a theory. I just we we need to prove that out by going going yeah, the Monte Cristo sandwich at uh, yeah. whatever restaurant used to have it deep fried sandwich. It's like oh well, Haven't excellent. You, have you ever had deep fried Oreos? Yes, you take Oreos. Yes, I have actually. And, and Twinkies and a Snickers. 
Yeah. And now yeah. if you come to if you come to my state, if you come to the Wisconsin State Fair, uh, one of the things that we're very proud of is our deep fried butter. So they'll take <laughs> four stick of butter and deep fry it. <laughs> and you just totally serious. Oh, that's got her deep fried ice cream too. <laughs> oh man, I feel my heart arteries hardening just <laughs> thinking about that. Uh, we had a nice rainbow right before this call, which is why I was a few minutes late. Went outside and uh, we've had yep. some massive weather coming through and nice rainbows across the sky. So I snapped some pictures of it. I'll have to post them later. Nothing like destroying visions of rainbows than coming in and talking with this crowd, this motley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. About eating deep fried butter. <laughs> oh. uh, uh. So I had a lively conversation I had to tell you guys about. Um, and it centers around Office. Okay. Oh, wow. uh, so on Twitter today, uh, someone made a comment and I made a comment back. And we got into a side conversation around when is when is Microsoft ever going to, if they will ever, uh, create a full client for Linux operating systems for Office? Now, this is something that's been volleyed back and forth, whether or not they're going to have Office for Linux. But I didn't know this, but they make Teams for Linux now. Mm -hmm. I did not know that. I didn't know There's that an either. actual distribution that you can install Teams uh, yeah. on Linux. So I think of that as kind of like the first step, right? So do you guys ever think that they'll, they'll, they'll go that route? Well, there's still the Windows, Linux, the Windows Linux system that is built into Windows 10 if you turn it on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. with the Microsoft kernel. But I'm, I'm asking, you know, do you think that, you know, these hardcore Linux users will ever get a office, an office suite? Well, but if, if depending on what the parity is of that Linux client, you have the ability to consume, you know, office documents and have and collaborate. Yeah. Yeah, not yet. not yet. Not yet. In the WSL and the Windows Substitute for Linux, you will eventually once they get the graphics to come over. Um, but you know, I, they were making the point that well, Microsoft was so anti-Linux years ago, and they would never create uh, an Office app for Linux. And I'm like, hey, you know what? Teams is they make Teams for Linux, and they're like, yeah. no, no way, no way. So I would not rule it off the table. Yeah, yeah, I mean, because Office for Mac. You had that. Well, that and they haven't updated. When's the last time they updated that? I mean, yes. <laughs> well, there used to be the Mac business unit, the Mac boo. My first building was at 115, 116 when I started I back in 2006. The, uh, the, the Mac boo was down at the bottom floor. I had a good friend, David Weiss, that worked down there and used, he ran the lab. So go down there and see all of the little, I, I'm not a Mac guy. So, what are the computers, the little cube ones that you could, uh, uh, Kind of in you know, run a uh, you know in parallel the, you know, them all and build it out so that the they Mac have Minis, the Mac Minis yeah, it, hundreds of them yeah mm. Mac Minis, yeah 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 the the minis yep they were so cute it was a pretty <laughs> it was a pretty little lab yeah. mini me yeah <laughs> so uh, as far as topics so uh, anybody else that's watching the live stream we got about let's see. Uh, looks like about oh, we got a handful of people that are watching the live stream. If you do have any questions about Microsoft products or services and would like us to attempt to answer them, feel free to uh, to comment. And uh, you gave us a directive in the first show this morning that each one of us had to come with what at least one question, one topic. I I presented mine. Right. I'd like to see these gentlemen. You know, come uh, on. And you know, but Mike, for the record, I ask that I I say that every week. <laughs> <laughs> some weeks i'm on some weeks yeah, i'm on yeah, yeah and usually stuff falls out i mean i think everybody remembers something like oh yeah and hey this came up and you know so something kind of falls out but the the i think we've you know usually all of those fresh ideas are discussed in the morning session <laughs> yeah they come out somewhere uh yeah well, there there is a uh, there's there's a couple topics. There's one uh, there's it's more of a, a a soapbox comment from Sean and the Microsoft Teams uh, group uh, in Facebook, um, and I'll, but I think it's a good discussion point. It's something I'm actually writing about. I've got two articles I'm working on right now. But uh, so he says as we become more mature in our use of Teams uh, because of the folder structure and the complexity of trying to keep up retention policy. Um, 
blah blah blah. It says it doesn't. Uh, it says Teams is not a view into uh, where all of the content is stored. So it's not a a good you know content management system. It's for the right. team based collaboration. Uh, so it goes on. It talks about the the structure. So we're seeing Teams is the place to collaborate when you're done. The SharePoint group site is the place to store the records. This is a complicated message to send out to users that already do not fully understand how records work. It's a great point. Yeah. Um, the importance of accurate metadata and standards and that really Teams is just a face on a group and for that, uh, that team site underneath. Mm -hmm. Any comments on the plan, the governance, the operations, or anything else? Um, you know, uh, like the messaging. So it's the, there's not a strong question there, but it's a great point. Is that um, you know, Teams is so much more about the uh, the collaboration, the activity, and the presentation layer of what's underneath. But for an organization that is really trying to drive down the messages, the importance of metadata of taxonomy about uh, the 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 information governance. Um, it's a confusing story. So I don't know what the I, I mean, this is what I'm writing you know articles about. There's a more and more uh, discussions around sprawl inside of uh, teams, which is just a, an extension of SharePoint and, and exchange and the sprawl that existed prior to that. And it's a it's a discussion in my mind more about information management, knowledge management systems uh, at all, not just teams. Teams just is the latest flavor of that discussion. But <laughs> any any thoughts of how you guys describe this, um, the uh, of, of governance and what people should be thinking about with teams when it comes to governance? Well, I mean, similar to what you're describing, it's. I've had numerous situations where I've had to gently explain or try to explain Teams versus SharePoint and people wanting to basically, can I surface my SharePoint site inside of Teams? Can I put SharePoint web parts and whatnot inside of Teams? And they want to bring discussions that are in SharePoint into Teams. Microsoft doesn't have a, a good strategy around that right now. Are you talking about like the uh, specifically around the teamifying, the teamification of uh, of legacy, you know, SharePoint team sites? And yeah, it's layer on top of that. Yeah, they it's there's not a clear message on that and how it works. Um, and so, you know, we don't have anything inside of teams that surfaces SharePoint stuff beyond document libraries and you know the I view or what pay web part page that sort of thing but there's not a greater level of integration surfacing SharePoint stuff in teams yeah I could say that uh, from you know and some of my experience has been around sitting in a room listening to even some of the partners try and do an explanation around how teams is supposed to be presented and how teams you know what what the solution is for the customer i kind of sit back and I, I wonder microsoft isn't giving a, a clear message even to the partners and the partners go into the customers and they get the customers all confused saying well teams can just do that you can do that in teams well, you can do that in teams you don't need sharepoint don't worry about sharepoint you can do that in teams and uh i've heard some of the the, the craziest stories uh, where, you know, they would say that, well, the partner told us we could do this, you know, or this, this, you know, they told us we could do that. We can do this. And it's, I think, I don't, I don't necessarily blame the partner. Um, I, I kind of blame some of the messaging coming from Microsoft. It's kind of, you know, uh, unless you're getting it directly from one product team, you might be getting mixed messages. Yeah. And that's not uncommon. I mean, there's such a, you know, it's uh, like that with the Yammer too. Hello. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's there's such a siloed company now. I mean, they really are. There's a I, I deal with that on the Azure side all the time. Where one team that's working on uh, an example, Azure Sentinel, doesn't know what the team for Log Analytics would ties right into Sentinel. They don't know what they're doing. And I'm like, you guys don't even talk to each other. <laughs> you know? Oh, we have yeah. a meet, we have a meeting like twice a week. <laughs> well, that's, that's okay. that, been a long history between. Oh, if you look at 
um, just the history of Office and and the other business applications like SharePoint, you know, these business systems and their their uh, integrations. And so it's uh, you know just over time you've seen it's, it's improved. They've gone in and and they're now creating exist, you know, uh, uh, consistent behaviors, consistent experiences across the the workloads but they've been other teams i mean i have to believe that jeff teeper now owning and driving a lot of that messaging and positioning and, and product features and direction of teams um we're going to see a, a more unified story with some of that in the back we've not seen anything specifically come out around this issue <laughs> of teams but the uh again i look it's it's a partner opportunity yeah <laughs> yeah 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 um it's an education thing too because there's some you know some folks that just don't they don't get the message they don't and they can't convey the message to end users very well yeah. or the, point, the end customer very well in my opinion uh working as you know we've all been kind of middlemen you know kind of the go-between uh and trying to be the trusted advisor if you will uh and sometimes you know, uh, they the customer is not getting the right message or the message that we think they should be getting. So true. Yeah, Very yeah true. I, I did an interview with um, former uh, Office Apps and Services MVP and and Regional Director uh, Benjamin Nylon, who was ShareGate uh, a couple of weeks back, and it's out. You can find it. It's <clears> part <throat> of the, uh, my MVP Buzz Chat series. It's up on my blo blog at Buckley Planet. Um, you can find that. Uh, he, but he came up with something really great. We were talking about kind of around this this issue and specifically some of the messaging that with their various products that do migration and and management of your know, admin tools around SharePoint and Teams and and groups, uh, Office 365 groups. They've not renamed groups to Microsoft 365 groups, have they? It's still Office 365 groups is the name of that, correct? I believe so. Today, today. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, today, today yeah. this week. But anyway, so he so he talked about um, kind of the, uh, the 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 front end to this uh, problem, the 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 middle and the and the kind of the back end. He talked about it. Says, well, the recommendations for this is working with clients around what is your onboarding, your provisioning process, and so to lock that down and be consistent <clears throat> in what your requirements are, whatever they are. That's Again, you can have very locked down organizations that want to control that provisioning process through every step. And, and there are others that want to leave it wide open. And there's neither one's right or wrong. There's just consequences to behaviors, you know, right. um, the things that you put in place. But um, to, to have a strategy for that provisioning, then you have once they're provisioned, once they're in your environment, they're on teams, what are your ongoing management activities the rules that guide, you know, how people use the the system, and that's where most of the governance. Now, governance, there's a you go a deep dive into that. That's where the inception happens. Leonardo <laughs> comes out behind the screen. You go another, you know, level down. City folds wait, up. Wait for the yeah. kick to wake back up. No, the, and then the uh, the last uh, for that uh, reference to the movie Inception for the three <laughs> people that have not seen that movie, you know. Um, or what's eating Gilbert grape? Either one's good. Um, the uh, and then once once you're, you're you're done is the what is the expiration? What's the uh, you know how are you managing that you know the archival process? And that's where you have like the DR the the backup and recovery the business continuity strategy for all of that. How you're handling things because it's also about um, risk mitigation. You can't just leave content unknown in a system. Um, and you know there there could be you know legal requirements around the the, the handling of that data and, and all that. So so there's kind of those three phases of things that you should be thinking about planning for and, and doing. It's not just you know hey we're going to go build a governance strategy. Well is it are you talking about the provisioning the front end? Are you talking about what's happening with the ongoing management? Are you talking about what happens? at the end of life of all those content and the conversations and videos and all those things, um, all things that you need to, to take into consideration. And, and where I jokingly referred to it as an opportunity for partners, but 
you know, Microsoft can go in and write and say, look, here's high level, here's things that we're doing, or here's scripts and tools that will help you do some of those activities. <clears throat> but customers and partners are the ones that have to come up with these prescriptive experiences and the prescriptive guidance on what to do in which circumstances, um, right. you know, so, and then provide feedback back to Microsoft saying, APIs need to do more, you need to do more within the console or go and build other partner solutions around those things, those gaps. Yeah, absolutely. The need for prescriptive guidance uh, only continues to grow. You know, we've talked about it before. Where's Neil when you need him? Yeah, yeah. well, especially when you're dealing with, uh, you talked about, uh, I worked with an a insurance company that had about 3,000 seats. And they spent literally a year just trying to figure out governance around, you know, getting people up to 365 and, and, and converting their internal websites to SharePoint and all this other kind of stuff. I mean, it takes time. It's a big project. It's nothing, you know, it's nothing you just jump into and say, oh, we're going to use the free version of Teams and we're going to run our entire company off of it. No. <laughs> Yeah, uh, like yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm not going to I'm not going to help you do that. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you're talking about a, a shop of 5 or 10 or 50 people in which case that's what they'll do. Yeah. 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 Well, when they you have line a site to everybody. They wouldn't know what a SharePoint was to get it. Yeah, SharePoint can definitely be for a lot of I mean a lot of things. I mean, you you get into complexity with SharePoint alone can be complete overkill. Um, if you're just trying to host a couple and you know uh, of, of, of internal websites or something like that, it's just to me it, it's just too 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 much complexity to get through just to get something simple accomplished. Yeah, that's my opinion. Yeah, there's truth in that. That's a good opinion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, I just um, again posted out in the uh, the two locations for the uh, live stream if you have questions and would like us to tackle them and the line has been cast yes uh let's see yeah it's part of the problem is that a lot of the questions that are asked out in these communities and we talk about this almost every week um they're, they're not short answers some of them are like that it's uh, very nuanced there's not a, a one quick answer to that it's a longer discussion <laughs> So yeah. for the teams guys, I mean, the uh, teams folks, I'm sorry, uh, that are out there. Um, so do you think that when Microsoft really jumped on, you know, progressing the teams platform that I, I remember when, you know, it was a thing that they just wanted when they changed from Skype over to teams, they were converting Skype for business over to teams that they called it the Slack killer. Right. Yeah. So, was a lot of that driven just to try and get part of that market segment that Slack already has? Because Slack is, I think Slack's market buy is like up here and, you know, Teams is down here. <laughs> so I, I don't know that for sure. I don't have numbers, but I mean. No, it's it's the opposite. Is it really? I mean, it is. now, from a, no, let's be honest here, because some of that could just be. <clears throat> Hey, they bought the suite, so they have teams. So is it actually actively being used? <laughs> yeah, but you can say that about any software application. And I would argue Slack is it, just like any others is in that bucket. There's an, an enterprise that will go and deploy a piece of technology and it might be, you know, uh, uh, used by, uh, you know, yes. daily, hourly by a fraction of those employees. And, and there'll be a good portion that aren't used at all. Like, I, I, I don't, and I don't know what, slack is doing about adoption of their platform but uh, to your first part of your question <laughs> that i do believe that was a a a one of the uh reasonings behind going and developing the product was yeah. to create something to battle slack because they saw it dipping into sharepoint and other tools yeah so it, it was a competitive stop um, but they didn't just go and uh, an architect kind of an add on to other existing pieces. They said, well, if we will leverage these pieces, but we're going to write something, we're going to do it the way that we would build it, 
you know, if these others didn't exist, but we'll <laughs> leverage what we can, but we'll write it from the ground up. So then, then I have to ask the question, what, where did Yammer go? I mean, where did Yammer fit into that? Because that was supposed to be the collaboration platform. Yammer was supposed to be the place that was, you know, hey, collaboration was supposed to happen there. I mean, at what point did they, they decide, you know what? Yammer isn't going to cut it. We got to create something else. It's a different solution. It, it, it's a, so this is, this gets back to what you were just saying, what we were talking about previously. It's the which tool to use when problem that Microsoft has had uh, uh, around these technologies. And I think, and 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 let's throw SharePoint uh, under the bus as well around this, <laughs> that part of the problem initially with SharePoint messaging and positioning was that it could be anything and everything to everyone. Yeah, that's how it was positioned. And and so it really was like, a, 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 remember, uh, you know, Benjamin and I doing a keynote for the European SharePoint conference and we were going through and joking and as part of the beginning of our session, like you need to build a CRM, SharePoint. You need to build a project team site, SharePoint. I need to build a custom portal for my team. I want to build an external website for my team. I want to, you know, whatever it is. And SharePoint was the answer. And uh, Microsoft came back and just said, you know what? We're, it, it, SharePoint is not the right solution or shouldn't be a solution at all for every problem that's out there. And uh, you know, in some ways it kind of goes, it's that cycle that we have in IT of, of going to the best of breed, to this all-inclusive, back to best in breed, to all-inclusive solutions. And I think that where we are in the cycle, you know, you could call Microsoft 365, I don't know anybody would call that you know, a single platform. There's all the pieces. It's a SKU that has the various components within that. Um, and and I don't see teams, uh, you know, trying to be everything to organizations. If you have a portal, which is for a lot of larger organizations, medium to large organizations, you go build a portal. It's not Teams. That's not Yammer. That's a SharePoint experience. Sure. Yeah. Um, if you are doing uh, community-based, um, that could be that's uh, all these things are integrated side by side with your portal, but is more of a knowledge capture, um, but just kind of a, a flat structure social engagement. That is Yammer. Um, if I'm doing some things that are project-based, uh, then it is Teams. And so, in my mind, yes, there's overlap between the three, but they coincide. There are very clear uh, use cases and examples for each of those. Does every organization need all three? No. My little company with my part-time employees, I use Teams. I don't have, I, I've got Yammer components that I use for partner stuff, but I don't need it for employees. Sure. Um, I don't need it for the knowledge base, and I don't have a SharePoint portal. For my organization, um, so it's uh, you know right tool for the right job. But when you need two of the three or all three of them, they should work together and have shared experiences. There will be some overlap, and you as an organization need to make a decision about some of that overlap, where your preferences based on the culture of collaboration in your organization, where it makes sense for your organization to uh, to do some of that overlapping activity. Anyway, sorry, that's my diatribe around that, but no, I've presented on that one. topic a lot. Yeah, that's cool because I mean, uh, working for startups, right? So the thing about startups is when you go in there and this will be the fourth, the fourth startup I've worked with, the fourth or fifth. Anyways, they just have a, a mismatch of applications that they use and most of them are open source, right? Yeah. But they still have that office, that Office 365 license sitting there. They just don't use the products. You know, they're using, <coughs> they're not using Teams. They're using, you know, all these other things. They're, they, you know, even using things like, you know, Lucid Chart and things like that. They're not using Visio. They're not using the, 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 the resources that they have. And it's just because, you know, like you said, even from a department a department standpoint, one department uses this, one department uses that, and they just go off on their own little tangents. 
A, so a lot can, of that is people brought that from their other their previous jobs. They right. they used they used Domo. They used Lucid Charts, and and there's no governance. There's no there's no there's no overreaching thing that says, "Hey, stop! We have this solution. You have to use this solution." Um, and that's when you start getting all this diversity. And that's why I was I was getting to the point that I mean, when Slack Slack is just Slack, right? They really don't make any other product. But when you're talking about Microsoft, you're getting that whole experience. You're getting the, you know, the Teams, the SharePoint, the, you know, the OneDrive, all that kind of stuff. You're getting all those multi more. If I, if you wanted to say you got a bigger, you got a bigger toolkit than you do with just a company that makes one one thing. Okay. Kind of like I was explaining to Christian a long while back. Uh, the way we used to do meetings is we would do, we would do all of the back and forth stuff on uh, on Slack. Um, the vocal part of the meeting was done on Skype for business. Uh, we would all have our uh, OneNote books open to the same place where we could go through the itinerary and mark things done and undone and so forth. And uh, then when when Slack when, when when Teams came along, that all of this got integrated into one window, and that was fun. Now, uh, that kind of is kind of what I'm seeing for small places, but the idea of all the overhead, the back end, the SharePoint, like I was saying, that's <clears throat> that's going to be kind of a mess for them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So was so from a history standpoint, was it live communicator first? And then it went right to to Skype. What, it no, was, was it? Uh, I'm trying to remember because that all happened. That was messenger, uh, messenger was first, wasn't it? Messenger, then live communi or communicator, or live communicator. Yeah, well, then then, then, then Skype they, and Skype for business. Yeah. Yeah. And no, then, there were. I think there were a couple iterations in between there. I'm trying to remember right. what it was before they bought um, live. Well, it was Windows Messenger. You know, they bought Placeware. Place. They bought yeah, Placeware, right. and that became uh, live meeting. So that that happened. That was right after I joined Microsoft. So that was two thousand six, two thousand seven. But there was like there was communicator, and then there was live meeting. There were two separate things, right? They were yeah, this, right. yeah, yeah. They acquired Skype too. I thought it was something else before it was. I think it went through a couple other name changes, at least one more, um, before yeah. Skype uh, sprung into existence. But um, yeah, name plates get moved around a lot. Yep. Good times. Good times. And now you have this battle with stream. So you, know what's, <laughs> well, you, know, you know what's funny, though? We were talking about um, you know, some of the, our frustrations with uh, Teams live meetings and, and what's lacking from uh, the competing webinar solutions like GoToMeeting and Zoom and, and WebEx. Microsoft bought what back in that era placeware was the premium product it was the the most beautiful of the the interfaces <clears throat> those, those products and had all of those features <laughs> what happened to that <laughs> what Stupid. happened to live meeting yeah anyway yeah where are they now yes that's what we need vh1 come on where are they now live meeting <laughs> Uh, yeah, somebody was trash talking Zoom today. Was making fun of it. I remember what did I see? I just over. I just it perked up at that. And oh yeah, yeah. You know the security thing or what? No, I don't know. Just uh, somebody just trash talking Microsoft um, hardware. Oh, I know what it was. Now it was in. There was an article about the um, closing of the Microsoft stores. Mm. Oh yeah. Yeah, since we don't, I'm just looking, I'm tracking here. No other questions that have come in. What are you guys' thoughts of the closing of the stores? Sad. Mm. To be honest, yeah. the noise that I heard about it was more around, oh, I really like going in and looking at all the new stuff and being able to actually look and touch. It's like walking into an Apple store. I don't buy anything from Apple by going into the store. But this is me personally, no. I know a lot of people do. Um, but I buy everything online. I mean, that's where my life has gone now is that, you know, most of my purchases are made online. Uh, and what I heard on Twitter, uh, on the social feeds when Microsoft announced that was like, oh, I liked it so much because I could go in and try. You know, I could go and 
and try a surface or I could go in and, 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 and try and do, you know, put my hands on it before I bought it kind of a yeah. deal. Um, They're so, losing the one surface support chain that they actually had that worked. Yeah, and it. I, I got the misfortune of buying one of the, the of getting a Surface Four that had the uh, the screen shimmy problem, which uh, failed while it was still in extended warranty. Which it was sent back for, to which I was sent another one that had the same problem. To which was sent back, <laughs> which I was sent another one that had the same problem, which was sent back, which I was sent another one that said they had the same problem, which was sent back, and I got yet another one. <laughs> Uh, um, Don't they, when, had I been let, a position in part of this time while they were still available, all I would have had to have done would have taken that 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 machine up to the uh, that that the Microsoft store in Gilbert. I would have been handed a new one, a brand new one, yeah, or something equivalent to what whatever that one was. So the stores were invaluable for that. They had people that knew what they were doing. People knew how to move things. People knew how to fix things. Then they had the, the vast educational programs that went on there. There were any number of user groups and so forth that would meet down there yeah. to put on yeah. the meetings. See, that, that um, was a huge benefit. Just, it was nice. It yeah. was a huge benefit. And I mean, uh, I had such plans. We had a we had a Microsoft store kiosk in one of the two malls in the city. It was just a little kiosk out in the middle of in between two uh, two other stores. But uh, I mean, that that was it. I had a problem. Let's say the, the, the one one of the surfaces I had trouble with was uh, I had a, a Surface uh, 2RT. This was I don't know if, if you remember, but I don't know that question, but that was at one point in time, uh, they, we got a voucher for you could get one of these things that did have an ARM processor with 32, megs, uh, 32 gigs of memory in it for a 259, something like that. It was a perk. Um, anyway, I wound up getting one of those simply because it was cheap. Mm -hmm. And it's a delightful little machine. We've still got the little machine. About three years, though, into its lifetime, the touchscreen quit. It, you couldn't touch anything. It was a known issue. It came about as a hardware update. But it was a huge number of people that were complaining about that in the various and sundry <clears throat> forums. They eventually did release a, a fix for it. But this was this particular one I, was one I took by that particular kiosk and said, hey, look, it's got, oh, say no more, say no more. Hey, we got one. Yeah. Here you go. Well, it's and there's it's that simple, but it, that, it, that machine still functions. But it's understandable, though. I mean, the the reality is that most of the stores, uh, uh, you know, and I don't know what the the final decision of which ones stay open. I mean, obviously, it makes sense in my mind to leave certain stores open, like the London store is actually uh, fairly busy all the time and is. Is kind of a marquee location. It's probably the most expensive of the all of their stores as far as location, but it's enough to, to they need to have you know that that presence in locations because Microsoft you know does their their offices they moved them out of London proper and it's down in uh, in Reading now, um, so it's 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 away from the city center and where people are. To, so it may, would make sense to have that, but I go to Salt Lake or I'd go into uh, like the Bellevue store. It was just always in Bellevue, right there, the closest to campus. Yeah. And it's still, I mean, there'd be times when it would be busy when some major release comes out. But most of the time, it was nothing compared to how busy the Apple stores were. It just, it never seemed to be like the the right fit. It's like they, they, they were chasing us to do more events and things just to, Get more people in, and we'll we'll throw the, these these uh, swag at you and other things if you come hold an event there. And we had some decent events that were there, but well, you know that uh, shifted now. That shifted because now they're trying to get us to use reactors. So right. you're right. So now they're saying when, hey, when you have one in your city, right? That's yeah, right. That's, that's right. Problem. And reactors and the MTCs. So now they're opening up the MTCs more and saying, hey, we want you to bring people into the MTCs. Which there are more of those around the country than reactors, um, but and they're, and their sales offices like we have just here in the Salt Lake and Lehigh. So just across the freeway from me, their new location. I've actually not been to the new location yet, but the old location on this side of the freeway, um, we would do events there, user groups. Um, we did our, um, you know, the 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 um, uh, the Office 365 Developer Boot Camp, for example, the Windows events. Um, where you know we brought in guest speakers and we put together these events sponsored by and fed by Microsoft. 
in their facilities. It was great. And they, uh, you know, they, they do more of those, then there's less need to go up. That was kind of the, what I told when I would see at the event, the store people from Salt downtown Salt Lake, they'd be like, hey, we've been, you know, they'd reach out to me, talked <clears throat> about doing this other event. I'm like, yeah, I just used the Lehigh facility. Yeah. 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 One, of the, one of the pundits actually had mentioned, and I don't know if it was the Rod or whoever, but they had mentioned that it's possible that uh, Microsoft is, you know, when they start closing these stores, um, they may be opening storefronts in these existing offices like they do at building you know uh, building 91 or whatever it is 93 93 93 91 92 something like that um, where it's just a storefront and it's yeah. part of their mtc or it's part of the reactor well mm. why wouldn't they not do something similar like why like it seems it would be cheaper just to have dedicated employees at best buy they, yeah, and they do. They actually, well, they have contracted employees because I can go into the Best Buy here and Apple actually has a contractor. Um, I, I knew the guy um, and he actually is a contractor for a local bar and he gets paid by Apple to sit there and talk to people about, you know, MacBook Pros and stuff like that. Right. Um, right inside of the Best Buy. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's, they, that that would be a lot less expensive than have an entire store. And for some mm. of these, like a Best Buy. Square footage that will be replacements or things like that. Yeah, the price of square footage in Bellevue Mall. Can you imagine what, I mean, it, it, <laughs> look at the Apple stores, how much money they're paying in, in, in rent. I can imagine what Microsoft's saying. Maybe we're just not breaking even on this thing. I don't know. Yeah, it's not for lack of trying on their part. It's, you know, because... <laughs> They certainly made a go at it. I know here in Cincinnati when they opened the uh, the one they had in Kenwood Town Center. I don't know if that one's slated to close, but I suspect it might be. Um, you know, there's an Apple store in there as well. Um, they've remodeled the Apple store. Uh, the, the Microsoft store was rebuilt. Um, nice thing. They try to draw people in. They'll do the VR things. They'll do the gaming. We'll do the sessions I've presented in a Microsoft store. Um, I think we had a user group in there one time. They're actively soliciting um, with the user groups in the area. So they've they've certainly made a go at it and they've tried. They've done what they could to uh, keep the locations open and doing help. Because I know, you, Christian, you mentioned it, the, the SharePoint Saturdays and the SharePoint events all around you know you can go to the you know you can go to the microsoft store and they're oftentimes ready to contribute something yeah so Absolutely. yeah yeah it, it it'll be as a it, like anything I, I, i'm sad i mean i understand it'd be if it's not making the numbers they gotta go you know mix it up it's just it's a it's a different crowd it's the well you know, covid didn't help right i mean that, yeah. that had to that, that that was the the straw that broke the back for you know lots of just microsoft yeah so yeah, yeah. <laughs> agreed yeah yeah um let's see kevin made a comment he says my favorite microsoft program was microsoft works i could create an easy <laughs> and simple database in less than 60 seconds oh yeah, I kevin, saw that. Kevin, kevin kevin microsoft <laughs> <laughs> the greatest piece of, of artistry that came out of microsoft was i mean and Windows Live Writer. No. <laughs> Microsoft nope. Bob. Oh, Bob. Bob, yeah, is. Bob oh. was, you know, it was the, the person who thought that up. I've always wanted to meet that person and maybe just punch him in the face once. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was, that, Bob was always this, kind of is, associated with Bob. Out there you really wanted. <laughs> it, was, it was always, sorry, what did you say, Hal? I said, it seems to me it's still available out there on some obscure website or two if you really want it. Oh, yeah. boy. I I was uh, laughing. I had fun last week uh, on on the R, one of the RD um, lists. Somebody had uh, said, hey, I'm getting this error message. I don't even know what it was. And they took kind of a screen capture of the error message they received. And I responded back. I threw it together pretty quick. I responded back. I said, I said, I'm getting the same error message. Mine looks slightly different. And it said, like, you know, are you trying to do this? Um, uh, you know, it was like, can, um, are, you, do you, are you trying to translate this in German? I think was the statement. And then I put below that, how can I help? And I put then Clippy. And I, said, <laughs> <laughs> I did that mock up and sent it back. And Clippy, you got to have him bounce up or the dog. 
What was it in Vista? Vista was a little dog that could pop up, yeah. and then you had the wizard, the, the the little wizard guy that would sit there on the screen. But I think that was all Vista, right? Or was that? I don't remember. I don't remember. Most people don't remember Vista. No, but I, I was just going to say about Bob. Um, I I think it was always attributed to Balmer. Um, I don't know that not that he invented it, but I you know I think he was the like the thumbs up to it or something. But uh, yeah, it no idea. Surprise me. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect uh, uh, artifact uh, of the Balmer era. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, there's a question here from Thomas. Um, says, uh, hi, when I add a SharePoint document library as a cloud storage in the files tab in Teams uh, and then open a file and close it, it always jumps to the starting point of the files tab and not to the last position inside the document library. Is there a solution for this? Guys, I, this annoys me to no end. And this is actually, I'd say, something similar to that. I've noticed that in Teams. Um, but I've noticed that when using File Explorer, I've not closed File Explorer, but I'm going and I'm I'm working in, like most of us do, I've got all of my various locations outlined, and I have like a, uh, I, like I have a folder that's set up for, in my favorites, for all of the images that I use on my blog. So I have a go-to place for storing those. And I'll go and open something, and next time I go to, to uh, to, to open to another, grab another image, I have to go navigate all through again. It can't snap to where I was last time for the exact same task, the same mm -hmm. process. And it just jumps back, and I've got to dig through to find the, the folder, which is a subfolder of a subfolder of a subfolder. That's bad coding. Yeah, but uh, well, and, and others would say, well, then don't don't store it there. It's like, yeah, I just love to have a flat interface with all of them. It's like there's a reason why I've got the structure that I have for logically finding those those assets. But uh, but in Teams, I've I've noticed the exact same thing that it goes back to the the top. And um, Thomas, there's no solution to that. The solution <laughs> is for you to dig through and go back and find it. I, you know, I don't know. I'm just I'm being capture openly the, negative. Uh, capture it, the URL a different way. And Thomas is going, what the hell are these guys good for? Gee, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> they need to fix it. <laughs> it's done busted. War, what is it good for? <laughs> it needed killing. I hear yeah. that's a legal defense in Texas. Yeah. Your Honor, he needed killing. Well, there you go. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Teams phone systems. Anybody? Anyone? No. No. Yeah. Um, do, do, do. Uh, is there any way to schedule exams in Teams uh, that allows time control since a student will open the exam? Mm, Not unless it's question. an add on. I don't think you do. I don't think so. No, I'm just, I was thinking if you can go and create a, a test or, uh, you know, within the forms in the uh, Microsoft forms, the the newer, the advanced version of that um, has more capability. Quizzes um, are not really a test but quiz. Uh, yeah, the quiz capability. Yeah, yes, yeah, it, it, it's in the advanced. Um, what the, I, I think it's still in preview. Um, but not that it allows that time control. Yeah. Trying to make it do too much, I think, at that point. Yeah, I mean, the the other way around that is that you just, uh, if everybody starts at the same time, and uh, if they have to submit their answers before the top of the hour, and then you close it down for everybody at that time, that's a way to time stamp it. But you'd have to be real time. There's no way to do it asynchronously yeah. and manage easy. that. Yes. Right. Yeah, essentially. Yeah, pencils down. Like, get it in here. Like, hey, I have 30 seconds to submit. And then otherwise, you get an F. Build the flow yeah. on top of it. Yeah. To possibly do that. Yeah. Or a power automate, sorry. Yeah. Power apps. Thank you for confusing everyone, Sean. <laughs> flow, power, power automate. Apps, power automate, flow. <laughs> 
Yeah, but that's a way you can do that. If they can, you can have a form with the request, and once they you know hit start, um, and then it can start a, a timer. And at the end of that hour, if they they need to submit, they get a couple warnings. Um, and if they don't close that and save up their uh, completed test by that time, then um, you know re records that. So uh, yeah, I, I think there's a way you can go and build that be relatively simple yeah yeah you guys you know make some money go ahead and build it so yeah <laughs> well, well there's the none of us are in the education sector but there's there's um, there's got to be some other tools that are out there that do something similar oh, i'm sure oh yeah uh do, 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 do. so um there's a question here of augmented reality is being used in some schools. How can it be used in teams? They actually have the testing. I know that um, they showed videos on, as a matter of fact, uh, where they're testing an entire team meeting happening uh, over the um, both using Oculus and um, the um, uh, HoloLens. So they had members. I remember that. I remember seeing the video where they had nine people on the screen and they were all wearing the headsets. But they they were in a virtual meeting. They can go up and they can shake each other's hands. They could you know have one on one conversations with each other. Um, I just saw that video like a week ago or two weeks ago. Somebody showed it to me. Well, I know this isn't helpful for somebody watching the video, the recording of this weeks later. But there yeah. is uh, there, there's the Commsverse event going on this week, so today, tomorrow, I think for three days, so sixth through ninth, uh, and they have uh, in their expo hall, they've got a VR uh, experience for all of the sponsors. And so you go take out, so here are Microsoft Teams experts, and they've put together an event. Sean, have you been in looking at the vendor booths this week? He just wants to look cool. It's not plugged in. He just yeah. wants that. I was just going to say that Sean's trying to look cool. Sean, you are not looking cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Cut me some slack. Yeah, yeah. Let me get this thing on. But it, so that's it. You can, there, there's an example of teams, people that have gone and built an experience around there. It wasn't an out of the box experience. And SharePoint Spaces is not yet, you know, generally available um, to go and, and play with. So, um, my correct me if i'm wrong i mean so the, the question is there is there something that's specifically with teams not that's out of the box would be my answer you've got to go do some building but there are some solutions out there um, but take a look at what the commsverse folks are doing and uh, reach out if you've got questions about ar vr and related to teams don't ask uh, one yeah <laughs> Um, King, the one person uh, to talk to is uh, is Mark Vale, former MVP, um, and uh, Vale Consulting. Uh, he's one of the organizers of the commsverse.com, uh, uh, that event. So definitely go check that out. Sean gave up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stop powering on. They never do. Demos are like that. Dun, 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 top of the hour. We're at the top of the hour. Um, yeah. Let me see if there's any final questions. Anything else? Uh, nothing else. No other questions asked here. Um, well, gentlemen, thank you again for participating this week. And um, we'll do it again next week. Right. See what happens. Like Remember the assignment. Yeah. Bring at least. What one topic? Bring one question. One topic. There will be a quiz. There will be a quiz. There yes. It's always a quiz. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks for those who are watching the live stream. Take and care. Will be, and for those that are watching, again, with all the recordings, it'll be up on YouTube here in the next uh, day or so. And also, if you go to BuckleyPlanet.com, you can find all past weeks and recordings, as well as a link list to every topic that we've covered. So you don't have to watch two hours, because it'll be two hours of content. You can jump to the specific topic that we covered. 
But if you're a glutton for punishment, you can watch it all. Feel free. You can watch it more watch. than once if you're really desperate. Get your pint of Ben and Jerry's and binge watch. That's what we should. It's it's must watch TV for Microsoft Teams and for the Microsoft community. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Some, take care, guys. Talk to you later. Take care. Bye. Bye.